I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Abhishek is a partner in the pricing assurance team and assists clients on topics related to price and contract benchmarking, strategic engagement reviews, and sourcing cost rationalization. Pratik is a vice president at Everest Group and a member of the pricing assurance practice, assisting clients on topics relating to solution design and review, pricing and contract assessment, cost optimization, and services benchmarking in IT applications and digital services. Banushi is a practice director in Everest Group sourcing and vendor management practice. In this role, she advises clients on maximizing value through their supply base engagements to obtain cost, business, and operational benefits. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Abhishek. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone uh, today to today's uh, session. If you move to the next page. Um, so just quickly summarizing what the discussion points are for today. Uh, we broadly cover it in three sections. One, we'll focus a bit on the key uh, focus areas for buyers in the APAC region, right? What are the global trends shaping the market, the prevalent sourcing strategies, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, then we'll we'll cover a little bit around pricing trends and forecasts um, in in this space, and then eventually, you know, just touching upon what some action items could be for uh, APAC uh, sourcing leaders. Right, um, that's kind of you know uh, what what we intend to do. What we also try and and aim for is a few minutes of a Q and A. Uh, we've received a few questions. We'll also request um you know participants to share questions as they come uh so that we can kind of you know uh, take it from there right so that's that's kind of the broad uh, agenda that we have for today now getting into the details um directly if you move to the next page uh we'll just start off with um you know <clears throat> just just a quick overview of um of how the IT services industry uh is is going so if you were to look at you know, the global economy per se, uh, it appears to be suffering from the double whammy of slowing economic growth, rising inflation outlook, and which obviously, you know, impacts demand. But interestingly, the APAC um, economy seems uh, seems resilient, right? Uh, as you can see, uh, both in the, in the twin colored bars, the 12 months ending March 2023, and the 12 months ending uh, March 2024, it, 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 it's, it's pretty much the most robust in terms of, in terms of an overall growth. Now, what could be driving it? Um, one, of course, you know, there's diversified constituent economies. You know, the APAC region is quite diverse. Um, each one of them, uh, you know, each one of the economies has its own uh, different, you know, flavors, if I may say. Uh, and, and that sometimes, you know, is a beneficial thing uh, as compared to perhaps, you know, let's say North America, which is a lesser number of economies, but larger. Europe, again, there's a high degree of interdependence between, you know, many countries, whereas APAC tends to be, tends to be slightly different. Um, there's also strong domestic demand, right, which, which pulls up uh, the overall IT services growth market. Um, as compared to some of the other parts of the of the world, even the economic policies have been uh, relatively prudent, uh, if I may say so. And then finally, strong macroeconomic fundamentals are uh, are are critical, right, uh, to to get this uh, to get this in place. Okay. Um, okay, so that's kind of you know the uh, the overall um, you know where where the market stands, the growth. Um, let's move to the next page and maybe maybe just delve a little bit deeper into some region specific nuances right um now even the geographic regions within apac uh, appear to have unique challenges and demand profiles or trends right uh, and so many of, some of these factors could include uh, the it maturity and digital inclusion for example right uh, the economic maturity uh, the provider ecosystem varies significantly across one from the other uh, and of course the macroeconomic policies and government policies uh, you know also play a role um, Banushi, you know, do you want to touch upon a few of the region-specific differences because uh, that that would make for an interesting uh, conversation? Sure, thanks, Abhishek. So, uh, like Abhishek pointed out, right, there are so many factors that lead to these differences. But uh, when you look at the geographies in themselves, the political environment, the business climate, they've actually led to a lot of differences across the globe, right? So, looking at Japan, for instance. There's a large number of uh, 
opportunities for larger size deals over there which obviously if you think about it uh, it puts some margin pressures within the economy within the services landscape itself because larger deals typically tend to give certain amount of discounting in the beginning right so uh, that is one factor that's happening in japan along with you know things such as importance given to metaverse in the rest of the apac landscape you would actually say that metaverse is a technology that did not take off but within japan uh, there are large tech companies that are collaborating with the government to actually establish a metaverse economic zone right so very interesting to see how that is different uh, when you compare it with let's say china where it is still a local players dominance that is taking place and of course with the supply chain disruptions that happened during the pandemic the after effects is still being suffered by the services economy within china right looking at india and that's where we all are from right so we're all based out of the north of india and uh, within india if we look at our uh, landscape the talent attraction all of those aspects were there right but now going forward there's a very strong digitalization mandate that is taking place amongst enterprises uh, however having said that the legacy mindset is still remaining right so when you think about something like cloud services and its adoption while it is growing at a very high rate there are many enterprises that have still not taken it up to a large extent till this point right uh, but again having said that within india itself 60 communication there's a very large bharat 60 project that is being taken up by the modi government along with a lot of collaboration with us across you know aspects such as artificial intelligence quantum mechanics semiconductor and also r and d which was Again, if you think about R and D moving to South Korea, that is the speciality of the South Korean, uh, you know, country, right? So uh, there's always been a strong demand within South Korea, if you look at it from manufacturing sector and technology sector. However, South Korea has not changed since the beginning of its time. Uh, it broke out as a nation through the manufacturing sector, and it continues to keep that moat. Uh, within the country, right? So there's not much services ecosystem that has developed till this point. Right? So many different nuances across uh, economies. Uh, ANZ, we've, they're making billions of dollars of investments in sustainability. Uh, the, you know, Thailand's and in Indonesia's, it's all a very fragmented market. But then again, looking at Singapore coming as an emerging economy, sorry, as the mature econ economy, that is sort of taking the lead over there, right? So uh, many different examples, many different nuances at play. But if we move to the next slide, uh, we wanted to give you a view of, you know, how uh, APAC geographies are still the top choice amongst offshore and nearshore delivery locations for procurement, supplier management, as well as supply chain management services. So if you look over here, uh, APAC 40 to 45 percent, nearshore Europe 40 to 45 percent. These percentages are basically talking about within GBS centers, how many, uh, you know, uh, are located within APAC. So let's say if 5 to 10% of total operations of procurement and SCM is delivered through GBS, then 40 to 45% are actually delivered through the APAC geographies, right? And within that, of course, there's lots of geographies again coming in. There's India, there's Philippines, which are always the top choices. Uh, but then differences also occur within the functions that are being delivered, right? So while FNA, HR, these are very mature or old sort of functions that are delivered from GBS APAC centers, procurement is actually picking up a lot. So when you go to any typical GBS center, you will see that there are multiple functions at play, including FNA, HR, and procurement and supply chain management is very uh, emerging at this point as well. And within procurement, the functions that are actually taking lead uh, would be, you know, of course, your spend analytics and insight. But now you would see more of mature procurement uh, functions as well coming over here as well, such as category management, end-to-end -end RFP execution, strategic sourcing, and so on and so forth. So these are the sort of changes we've seen across time, right? And uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, we wanted to actually give you, uh, we wanted to actually give you, uh, take your view uh, through a quick poll, right? So Abhishek, do you want to quickly explain this one? Sure, sure, absolutely. Thanks, Manushi. So, you know, uh, speaking of locations, right, um, we just wanted to get the participants' view on which locations um, do your GBS centers or outsource service providers deliver from. Uh, please do select all 
that apply. Um, yeah. And if we can start the poll. Okay, okay, I think uh, we have some pretty interesting results here, not, not surprisingly. Uh, India and Philippines, you know, really at the top 90%, 45% um, as we go, and then, you know, other key geographies as well. But then uh, I think what's what's most interesting is also the onshore locations, right, for, for kind of, you know, delivery, the US, UK, ANZ, uh, and near shore, which basically just proves the point that you know, work will flow um, to its most optimal place of delivery, right? And there are maybe benefits in having some other things centralized, right? And not just a cost angle, right? Because generally, we would see the opposite, right? Flowing more towards uh, the APAC region. Uh, any, any other thoughts, uh, Pratik or Banushi, you pick up from, from this, uh, from the results? Yeah, I think uh, it's also... Okay, sorry, Prati. Are you saying something? No, no, Manushi, please go ahead. I think I think there, there's 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 one side which kinds of uh, you know um, corroborates with whatever output we have seen just now um, in the subsequent section. Exactly right. I think Prateek is going to share some of those insights in a bit, but uh, that's what I was saying. That it's very interesting to see how India, then Philippines, then China, they're following the same trend that we also see, right? So really close to what we have also. Uh, research within our insights. And if we move to the next slide, uh, we'll actually be able to see how, um, you know, India, again, putting with the same insights that we saw through the poll that we've taken, India is maintaining leadership as the preferred offshoring uh, destination, right? So uh, other locations such as Philippines uh, and, you know, China and uh, let's say your rest of the Asia, they're also there in the picture. But India is taking the lead, especially with the IT services. And if you look at something like contact center services, then that is where Philippines would be coming into play, right? And one interesting difference that you would see in this particular space is that the skill sets that are being offered across geographies or the specialist skill sets, they also vary a lot, right? So India is maintaining, let's say, dominance across all of the IT services skill sets. But then Philippines will be coming in for uh, within IT, if you think about it, only for the application support and QA testing type of roles, right? And similar uh, things are happening with the rest of Asia as well. So now, if we link it back to the point that we talked about in the India uh, you know, slide, geographic nuances, the whole investment that we're taking, digitalization mandates that are going on, is very closely linking to what is happening within the India geography as well, right? So uh, that is just to give you an overall view. And of course, the near show geographies, you know, again, you can see as uh, in the previous slides, the US and UK always will have the software architects, uh, cloud architects, IT security, all of those aspects will always be done from those, right? But within offshoring, uh, this is the landscape that is taking place, right? So uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, we also wanted to share a little bit around, you know, how this is actually affecting the center setup activity. So, Prateek, do you want to give us a quick view of this one? Sure, Manushi. And I think this this was the slide I was uh, referring to earlier. So, um, we try to identify those locations wherein majority of the new centers are getting set up over the past few years. Now, on this slide, we have given that view for both 2021 as well as uh, 2022. So a couple of observations on this. First is that it points to an increased uh, leverage of distributed uh, location. So um, we see that clients are fairly comfortable in distributing their IT organization, their BP organization across locations, not only to address the concerns related to talent availability, but also to ensure that the business continuity um, uh, you know, prevails. The second observation is um, in terms of APAC centric uh, offshore near shore center. And this was also kind of highlighted in terms of the poll output. So, India, Philippines, and China clearly ruling the roost. Um, uh, they are the top three preferred locations uh, for the new center setup. And for India specifically, the year on year increase has been astonishing. So, from 72 in 2021 to 158, it's like uh, more than double. 
uh, in 2022, right? Uh, even though some part of it can be attributed to the pent up demand just after the pandemic, but then the pace itself suggests a material increase in terms of you know uh, comfort level for offshoring. And uh, because of the increased traction in offshoring nearshoring, we have also seen some uh, implications in the overall operating model of the IT organization. Um, we also see you know, some uh, bit of an increase in terms of offshoring percentage itself. So on the right hand side, you would see that increase quantum across uh, transactional BPO services as well as application maintenance. Uh, our observation is that um, you know, for transactional BPO services, the increase in offshore proportion has been slightly uh, or rather I should say relatively higher compared to that in application maintenance. The reason is because application maintenance has traditionally been an area wherein um, which has been fairly matured. Um, you know, it's it's more of a base effect. Uh, the AM, the application maintenance, um, the leverage of offshore nature has already been very high. Let's see on the next slide as to which are some of the preferred locations for IT ADM work, application development and maintenance work, uh, et cetera. Okay, so over here we have uh, depicted the locations for IT application development and maintenance services in our proprietary peak frame, pre peak matrix uh, framework. Uh, for IT ADM services, we clearly see, um, you know, again, APAC locations like tier one cities of India, um, China and, and Philippines uh, leading the path. So while India's uh, ranking and uh, you know, positioning is not surprising, What's surprising is the uh, is is the presence of Philippines uh, within the leadership group, and just just to highlight, it's an IT ADM uh, specific uh, you know location peak that we are referring to over here. Uh, Philippines or I should say Manila has traditionally been considered as a mature location when it comes to BPO services, but off late it has gained huge traction even on the IT ADM side. Um, in terms of you know some of the contenders you know um, tier two cities of India you know um, Nagpur, Kochi, uh, Chennai, uh, uh, you know Jaipur, Lucknow these are some of the emerging tier two cities of India which are extensively being leveraged by some of the providers. Then we also see Poland and Mexico in that category of uh, major contenders. So this is the new center setup activity uh, for uh, 2022 when we also witness some uptick in the demand. Um, so what's the contemporary view is also important to understand. Um, we can see that on the next slide. Okay. So now since India is one of the leaders in terms of preferred location for outsource services, we thought to you now come up with a view in terms of market talent uh, demand for IT services for some of the uh, prevalent location of uh, India. So over here, uh, we have extracted this, this view from our proprietary talent genius tool. Now, assuming January 2022 as the base, um, we are seeing some slowdown um, in demand for new, I, new IT talent across the locations, across locations, I would say. Uh, during the start of 2022, we witnessed a huge demand uptick. Uh, especially in two locations, Delhi NCR and Bangalore. But since then, the trend has been um, more of a secular um, you know, thing rather than you know, being, being uh, very different for uh, a few locations. Over the past few months, uh, we are seeing talent demand uh, reaching out to the lowest level since 2022, at least for a few locations. So this is the, this is the view for India specifically. Uh, Let's check with Banushi if she has similar insights for some of the other uh, near shore slash offshore locations. Banushi? Yeah, most definitely, Prateek. I mean, if you compare this to the other offshore or near shore locations, let's take an example of, let's say, Mexico or Poland, right? Over here, all the geographies are still at a flat angle, right? They're declining flatly. There's a certain time frame that they have taken. But in other geographies, it is actually like a rise and then a sudden fall, right? So more similar to how you see the Kolkata curve playing out. That's how we would see Mexico and Poland uh, being, you know, affected by the whole attrition story. 
so actually this attrition story has been playing out so much and i know that pratik uh, spoke a little bit about our talent genius offering uh, but uh, we also have been hearing a lot from you know companies about how they can hire where they can hire where they should find the right skill sets talent and so on and so forth and because of this we have done a lot of research lately within this area right so we are tracking uh, job boards such as glassdoor indeed etc we are tracking a lot of you know global statistics macro trends uh, we also of course have our own global services location related insights that we've shared a little bit in the previous couple of slides and through all of this we are actually coming up with this whole set of data as to where you will find the right talent and which locations you should be going to right which is within this talent genius offering so uh, just a little bit around that right but uh, we wanted to actually move on to the next poll again yet another poll and get your view now coming to your as an enterprise what is your current satisfaction with your outsourced service providers we have lots of options between highly satisfied and highly dissatisfied and we just wanted to get your view on this particular aspect and the reason we are undertaking this poll is because uh, we have actually been seen seeing very i mean okay i'll wait for the results but uh, we've actually been seeing a lot of changes from the past couple of years right in terms of their sat enterprise satisfaction with their providers so let's give this another couple of seconds okay great great so i see that the results are pointing towards a moderately satisfied right 55% say that they're moderately satisfied and there is nobody who is highly dissatisfied okay interesting very interesting um anything that you have to you know any initial reaction abhishek or pratik to this the if i were to just you know move it by 90 degrees i see a uh... what we call in a bit of a normal distribution curve right mm -hmm. <laughs> around you know the the highly um it's it's kind of you know um most of it seems to be kind of you know neutral or moderately satisfied right uh which is which is actually actually not surprising um just just given the fact that uh, over the past Uh, i think over the past couple of years a, a lot of things have kind of you know happened where despite the best intent right from service providers to get things done because of the talent crunch i think a lot of things leaded to a bit of a lukewarm experience for for many for many clients so uh, so yeah but but most interesting thing is that none of the participants or attendees today are seem to be highly satis highly dissatisfied which is actually a good thing to see right because uh, sometimes we we think that there will definitely be cases where people are frustrated with their provider with their providers doesn't seem to be the case here agreed agreed and uh, i think like i i am especially surprised to see these results because uh, we have also uh, you know surveyed so now in the next slide if we move to the next slide i'll show case why i'm surprised by these results because we have actually been surveying a lot of enterprises in the past couple of months right and we've seen that satisfaction with service providers has sort of declined when we compare it to the past right in the last 12 months and this decline is especially pronounced when you look at the apac geographies right so if you look at this top red box you see that 39% uh, it may not seem like a very you know large number but if we compare it to the previous years this number is a lot larger so there's a sort of 10 to 20% increase in that dissatisfaction level that we've seen across the uh, survey enterprises so um we actually spoke to companies as to why they are experiencing this particular dissatisfaction right and uh, we found out that the whole uh, you know pandemic and all the uh, support that service providers had been providing at that point of time had sort of uh, reinstilled that trust within the enterprise service provider relationship but now enterprises are actually looking beyond right so it's not just enough to ensure supply continuity and just be there it's also important to actually uh, move beyond and uh, give some other sort of you know innovative or proactive approaches when it comes to enterprise uh, getting that same level of enterprise satisfaction and actually uh, so we received uh, and you know abhishek 
like we received a lot of like different different responses across geographies right so if you look at europe north america rest of the world they're completely different in terms of the buyer expectations and the dissatisfaction and maybe that's why uh, you know the curve sort of we've seen it move a lot in the past like sort of couple of years also and if i come again back to the geographic nuances when it comes to apac right over here uh, some of the concerns also range around security uh, so for instance yeah, now moving back to china they come up with a similar uh, you know law to data privacy so, which is kind of echoing what the gdpr is talking about right and they're coming up with yet another regulation on the same right so that is sort of decreasing the ease of doing business within the country and it is also affecting the way service providers are able to provide the services within the country right so apac buyer expectations are different and apac service provider delivery needs to be tailored to that particular aspect right so um, that is a little bit of a view of the to overall dissatisfaction which is by the way the highest uh, within apac uh, but if we move to the next slide uh, we just wanted to showcase what the top you know uh, priorities are within APAC geographies, right? And if you see over here, now this shift is really interesting, right? So number one is cost optimization. And the last one, number five, is talent management. So talent has actually moved down the ladder and which is sort of, again, linking back to the data we showed earlier as to how attrition is not uh, the biggest problem of enterprises anymore, right? And I think we got a lot of questions on these areas, right? Buyer expectations, how they're different for APAC geographies. And uh, this slide will actually help put, uh, give an answer to all of those questions around the top priorities that buyers have, cost containment, uh, you know, driving savings. Many um, enterprises are talking about, you know, buying the dip at this point of time because they're so concerned about uh, costs and they're trying to get better deals from their service providers. And the second one, if you look over here, is experience and productivity, right? So this particular aspect, productivity, especially with the IT services, is becoming more and more important. And this is linking very closely to the performance-related uh, SLAs that we have within our contracts as well. So all of these are sort of going down to your entire contracting, your service delivery, all those aspects, right? Now, uh, looking at the bottom of the slide, right, before 2020 and 2023 and beyond, while we were focusing a little bit more on, you know, cost savings, business continuity, so on and so forth before, the future is actually really different. So, uh, you know, Prateek, do you have any, you know, perspective to add on the future view and how we've actually seen this huge shift? Sure, Vanushi. And I think uh, with the prevailing uncertainty, um, I would say APAC enterprises especially have turned cautious and that's not surprising to be honest, right? Uh, that's, that's getting reflected in terms of the changing priorities that we see in various deals, various uh, contracts, various RFPs in fact. Uh, in terms of some of the changing priorities, uh, we see more focus on value realization. Essentially, uh, the clients are giving more emphasis on return on investment rather than investing on any proof of concept. So the expectation from service providers is to essentially uh, define what value is and then enable it. Right? We also see more focus on business enablement, essentially how the tech transformation is impacting the business. Uh, that's another uh, priority area, how, how business is aligned with IT uh, and vice versa. And lastly, there's emphasis on growing uh, top line and protecting bottom line. So, which means that there would be an impact on moonshot investments going forward. Um, there would be emphasis on keeping the lights on and possibly emphasizing more on enhancing the uh, user experience rather than coming up with a purely greenfield um, investment thing. I, I think I think these are uh, the uh, the some of the priority areas, and I I would say some of these would prevail for a foreseeable future. Um, if we go to the next section, we will we'll see the impact of uh, all of the areas, all insights that we have given till now on deal pricing, on services pricing. Um, next slide, please. And, um, before 
jumping on to the insights um, another poll for the participants so over here we would like to understand the increase in ft rates for in demand skill sets that you have been experiencing over the past couple of uh, months uh, whether you have observed a significant increase um, up to the tune of 5 to 10% uh, or moderate increase 2 to 4% or let's say no change or even decrease in ft rate um the poll would start now so in the in the meantime i'll i'll, I'll share a quick trivia i think uh, we also used to ask the same question in some of the webinars that we used to conduct uh, last year in 2022 back then the situation was slightly different right uh, so the poll output used to be concentrated across two or max three options i think i think yeah, the output that we are seeing over here is slightly distributed it but then more or less it is pointing to the fact that uh, everyone expects a moderate increase a 2 to 4% increase uh, a few outputs suggest that there would be negligible increase as well and uh, then we have 10% respondent who are saying uh, no change uh, surprisingly no one is uh, no one has highlighted that there would be a decrease in ft rates uh, which is which is which is uh, kind of uh, a bit surprising uh abhishek what are your views what are your thoughts on this uh, poll result yeah yeah well it's interesting again like i said you know there's no decrease in ft rates uh, i think that there's a couple of things uh, behind this one uh yes globally if you were to take a look at it things seem to be going back to what we call a buyers market right for sure right but if we but um what is also enabling potentially providers giving more discounts or you know flat keeping things flat is that as compared to the euro british pound or us dollar uh, the depreciation in currencies has actually helped right you know because that takes away some edge of the of the cost of living adjustment increase um having said that you know there's also uh, i mean inflation is there right and inflation uh, i can at least speak having lived all my life in india eight bites extremely bad in in some in developing countries as it does as opposed to in in developed countries for sure right because there's there's just uh it, it just so plus combined with the dynamics of the talent market right um you know the 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 increases need to be more consistent the percentages consistently need to be higher so there's still a bit of an overhang of uh, of the high wage increases which is seen so uh, again an interesting thing but uh, but again seeing that 60% have kind of seen a moderate increase is uh, is is a pretty good testament to that fact that the apac market you know has its own nuances to consider definitely abhishek and uh, i think if, if we go to the next slide please so before before we jump on to the insights that we have on basis of our deal database and and our interaction with uh, multiple of our clients let me quickly talk about uh, our observations of uh, 2022 right uh, So 2022 was an eventful year for IT services especially uh the same was getting reflected in terms of the movement that was uh, being observed on the TNM uh, pricing front essentially the input pricing uh, as 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 we uh, say the pace at which the input pricing or the FT pricing increased was phenomenal so there were multiple reasons uh, for that increase uh, that there was a talent demand supply mismatch and the supply was uh, further exacerbated because of the on with the, because of the ongoing war between ukraine and russia uh, so eastern europe uh, got uh, got impacted then mostly throughout the year uh, most of the service providers were reeling with very high attrition right additionally you know if we talk about major major apac locations be it uh, be it uh, australia singapore or even japan um each of these locations were witnessing relatively um higher inflationary pressure now because of the talent demand supply mismatch and and inflationary environment um we were seeing slightly higher increases on the ft pricing front uh, at least on the in demand skills uh, the increase was substantial um in terms of quantum more than 6% increase year on year increase for some of the skills um uh, within it applications and engineering services category i would say um, something like full stack development sap s4hana 
fractal fusion. These are some of the skills wherein the FT price increase was uh, significant. On the cloud and infrastructure side, services side, um, you know, something like cyber security, cloud security, uh, application security, container. Uh, these were some of the areas wherein uh, uh, the increase was significant. And this was throughout uh, 2022. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk about uh, what has been the trend observed in the past five months, right? Uh, our observation is that uh, the FT pricing has continued to increase, albeit the pace at which it has increased has significantly moderated, right? Uh, we are not at all seeing those levels of six to seven percent increases that were witnessed last year. Right? Um, so for traditional uh, skills, um, which include the likes of .NET, Standard Java, C, C++, the increase is anywhere between zero to one percent uh, for uh, some of the major APAC locations. Uh, essentially, it has either remained static or has gone up uh, slightly. Uh, on the other hand, for some of the specialized skills, the increase uh, is, is slightly higher. Uh, so one to 2% uh, increase um, in, in Australia and Singapore. Uh, the same case was, was observed in cloud and uh, cybersecurity. Cybersecurity especially is an area which wherein the uh, pace is, or, or rather the momentum uh, has remained uh, consistent. The price increase is on a uh, slightly higher side, reason being this is an area wherein talent supply demand um, mismatch, it, it is still uh, persisting, which is why, you know, the, the uh, barring these areas overall, it's generally remained stagnant or has gone up uh, slightly. So this is the, this is the contemporary view. Um, if we correlate with the poll results, I would say, uh, yeah, majority of the respondents, they also uh, agree to the fact that it's a moderate increase. Uh, possibly they, they were also uh, referring to the specialized skills wherein we see, we witness such moderate increase. In, in traditional uh, skills, we still um, are seeing more or less Okay, um, I think there's a bit of a gap which came, uh, Pratik, or maybe it was because of me. Sorry, con please continue, Pratik. I thought uh, your voice became static for a while. <laughs> Hello, is it better now? It is, it is, yeah. Okay. Uh, so as I was talking about uh, the fact that on the previous slide, uh, you know, the the uh, view was more related to the input-based pricing, wherein uh, the uh, increase has either remained uh, stagnant, the pricing has either remained stagnant or has gone up slightly. Uh, but this is the view on the input-based pricing or FT price pricing uh, front. If we go on to the next slide, um, we will share our perspective on what has happened on the uh, output based pricing. Essentially, this is the view wherein we take into consideration both FT pricing as well as the solution inside. Now, on the output based pricing front, we clearly see a slightly different picture. Now, on this slide, we have we have depicted the trend for SAP AMS per ticket pricing. Uh, essentially, the trend in terms of per ticket resolution that we see in SAP application maintenance and support uh, deals. So this, this view assumes delivery to Australian clients from best in class uh, offshore from India, right? So between, between 2020 and 2022, um, we saw a declining trend. So the per ticket pricing declined by almost four to 6.5%. And, and this is despite the fact that FT pricing, especially they went on increasing, which means that uh, you know, all the remaining factors, they were negating the increase on the FT pricing front. Let's check with Abhishek as to which are those remaining factors which have negated that uh, increase on FT pricing front. Abhishek? <clears throat> sure. <clears throat> so obviously, you know, uh, even though wages increase over time, what's happened is that, um, 
A, because of rising offshoring, right? You know, as deals progress, you know, deals get renewed, clients get more comfortable with a re increasing degree of offshore usage. So, so that keeps the overall per ticket cost down because the solution to, let's say, you know, there's like 50% or 40% done in Australia. Now it's just 20%. The rest has moved to India or Philippines, right? That's, of course, one. Automation has been a game changer and automation actually never really gets applied in one go, right? There's an ongoing journey depending on the end state uh, where the client wants to get to, the starting point, the underlying considerations, volumes, a lot of this stuff. And overall, there's a cascading effect which leads to, um, you know, better results, better kind of, you know, applicability of effort reduction over the years. Um, I think then there's also the whole element which is related to, to, to a bit to automation, but across broader tools which is around standardized resolution or shift left, right? Um, as in, you know, better, more intuitive knowledge management, more intuitive self-service tools, right? So uh, rather than people just complaining, hey, you know, I've lost my password or, you know, there's some access issue or some of the simple things, uh, they have been kind of, you know, just done that, okay, you know, you just need to go to this portal, enter your details and you'll get a new password, right? So that's what's called shift left rather than, you know, contacting a team who will then further work on the application let's just try and move things more to uh, you know auto resolution or shift left so overall what that does is that on a per ticket pricing kind of you know it just it just the the effort uh, kind of you know goes down which which takes it uh, which takes the part the cost down now i think the interesting part also is that in 2023 a uh, couple of things one the wage increases over time have been significant right so it becomes difficult after a point to reduce these uh, charges uh, and then also there is the element of, um, of you know, how much uh, can automation or tooling bring? You know, is there a plateauing happening, right? Now that's a conversation for, for another time, but uh, some bit of that plateauing in deals, which have seen a lot of automation usage, uh, you know, has actually started to happen. So that's why we see a bit of a, you know, upturn in the U coming up. So it remains to be seen, you know, where, AI and chat GPT and all these nice uh, technologies take us, but, but uh, that's the, I mean, the jury is still out, right, on, on how much of an impact and when it would have it. If you move to the next page, <clears throat> uh, now what's our expectation through, through the next few months, right? Uh, clearly, uh, for FT pricing, we see mostly flat or minor increases. Uh, and they could be uh, with, with some exceptions. So exception one is that they could be pockets of material reduction in supplier consolidation scenarios, right? If it's just a renewal or some expansion, it's hard to get uh, price reduction per se. But if let's say, you know, there's an RFP out to consolidate from 10 providers down to three, obviously because of the uptick in the pie and the consolidated view, which they're getting, even suppliers would be more than willing to maybe... Uh, contribute a bit in terms of their margin to get an overall better top line, right? That's that's how things work. Um, I think, what about productivity and pricing model, uh, Pratik? I, I touched a little bit about flattening, but do you want to maybe expand a little bit? Correct, correct. And and I would say it would it would sound a bit provocative for the audience over here, but, but uh, to be honest, we expect the automation benefits to plateau from here on, right? Uh, so third, generation contracts likely to see flattening of the committed ongoing productivity curve. Now over here, we would um, take an example of AMS again, application maintenance and support opportunities. So back in 2017 to 2022 timeframe, um, we used to see deals wherein service providers used to uh, propose very aggressive productivity, um, productivity up to the tune of uh, 45 to 50% over a five year uh, deal term. Right, uh, which means that if you're starting at 100 FT uh, in year one, you would end up at uh, 50 FTs roughly uh, by, by, by year five, right? And this was primarily uh, driven by some of the scalable automation solutions such as automated monitoring, uh, conversational um, chatbot, RPAs, et cetera, right? Um, most of the enterprises who have, uh, who are fairly matured in that uh, outsourcing journey, they have already seen or deployed such uh, scalable automation ex accelerators. Now, so what we are trying to say is that any productivity from here on would be difficult to achieve. Of course, there are talks uh, going on 
um, in terms of new age automation themes such as generative AI, observability, low code app, application development. However, at this stage, uh, those are more um, in the use case identification phase. So none of the providers are essentially talking about or rather committing the productivity associated with these new age automation levers. Uh, which is why we feel that uh, productivity going forward would either uh, would would come down slightly. Probably six to twelve months down the line, we may see impact of these new age themes uh, start uh, coming in in uh, some of the new deals. Uh, likewise, even on the pricing model side, we expect some increase on the outcome based uh, fee element. Um, so uh, most of the enterprises are preferring that element because it, it presents an opportunity. Um, to, to have more skin in the game from service provider side. So we firmly believe that the percentage of outcome-based pricing would, would uh, increase going forward. So these are some of the expectations uh, through the end of uh, 2023 from our side. Sure, thanks for the... Uh... So uh, <clears throat> I think that till now we've covered, uh, you know, a bit of the context setting, a bit on the pricing trends. Let's just now look at um you know what some action items could be for for sourcing stakeholders uh, within APAC right uh and we'll quickly I think in terms of time what we'll try and do is is cover it in the next four to five minutes so that we can have a few uh minutes left for questions um okay shall we move to the next page Vanusha do you want to quickly talk through these uh these couple of examples sure sure thanks Abhishek so uh, vendor consolidation, right? This is a story that we have been uh, hearing for a long time. It's a you know, smart vendor consolidation, making sure your portfolio is optimized and so on and so forth. But in this particular action item, which is the first one, we wanted to actually give you a view of how introducing competition is a way to actually drive, uh, you know, sort of cost reductions uh, with your current service providers, right? So consider that your portfolio was, uh, let's say, 100 application services providers. Now you've consolidated it down to three application services providers. Uh, having done that, you still need to think about uh, whether you're getting the right pricing with these preferred suppliers, uh, whether you're sort of taking that champion challenger approach. You have introduced enough competition, not just in terms of costs, right, but uh, also in terms of the delivery aspect. So these are just two examples that we wanted to provide in terms of how big companies have actually used this approach to drive down costs and also de-risk your portfolio, so to say. Uh, Prateek, do you want to take up the next action item that we have for sourcing? Sure, Vanishi. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, the, the next action item is to uh, understand um, uh, where exactly your current market pricing stand vis-a-vis, -vis, um, where, where exactly your current pricing stand vis-a-vis -vis market benchmark. So what we suggest to enterprises is to use current and contemporary external market data to understand those requirements. Because you know, often dated benchmarking data um, leads to erroneous uh, decisions. So, and just to, just to highlight one more thing, so data is just one uh, part to it. Pricing, for example, is just one part of it. If, if, you, if you evaluate the overall portfolio, uh, even the solution parameters and some of the commercial levers, uh, those also impact the overall um, pricing and, and in TCO. I'm, I'm going to talk about some of those commercial levers um, in a while. Um, and lastly, if, if, if all these things are addressed, probably a handsome uh, ROI is almost guaranteed. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, those of this, this yeah okay okay sure 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 absolutely um, i think you know in the in the vein of you know just making sure that um you know enterprises have access to contemporary data right uh, i'll give an example that you know just a couple of weeks back i was speaking to one of our clients and they mentioned that well you know that they've got a benchmark done back in 2020 they can use that to drive it well I think for a rough order of magnitude business case development, maybe that works, right? But for something which is to be negotiated with providers to drive savings currently, it needs to be as 
as um, as as contemporary as possible. And you know, just as a as a bit of an offer for participants, and and just a quick note, this is only for buy side enterprises. We have a, a complimentary price check. So from uh, you'll see in your respective chat windows a link pop up, where if interested, you can choose up to three roles. Uh, and three countries, right, from us from the set listed below, uh, and then basis that we'll be happy to uh, provide a complementary set of uh, contemporary benchmarks for these for this subset, uh, and followed by a bit of a, a quick conversation to to take you through that. Maybe you know uh, just guide you through, uh, you know how some of uh, and the enterprises are looking at uh, establishing savings uh, through this. Right? Okay, um, so we we uh, request you to make use of uh, use of that uh, use of this this offer, uh, and look forward to speaking. Shall we move ahead to the next page? Okay, over to you guys to talk through this, Banerjee and uh, Pratik. So this this next uh, action item for sourcing leaders is to give emphasis on 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 some of the commercial levers. Uh, like I said earlier. Uh, there are multiple other aspects which impact your overall uh, total cost of ownership. It's not just the FT pricing, but also the solution sizing and some of the commercial levers, right? And we do have evidences which suggest that smartly negotiated commercial levers do bring down the uh, total cost of ownership. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll um, highlight the top three uh, factors. So first is in terms of having a balanced um, forest risk. So traditionally, it's the service providers who own the FX uh, risk. So if there's any uh, forex depreciation, they end up benefiting. If there's any uh, appreciation, uh, they, they lose, some, lose out some uh, money. Um, what we suggest is that um, the buyers and the service providers, they should have a balanced FX risk. And by balanced, I mean um, having a clause wherein both uh, the parties, they share an impact of FX fluctuations that's happening. Um, the reason is because uh, over the past uh, few years, we have been witnessing a consistent uh, depreciation of some of the offshore slash near shore local currencies vis-a-vis -vis, um, USD. And uh, that kind of provides cushion in terms of the, uh, against the rising uh, wage inflation. So, so that's that's the number one action item for uh, service providers, for service providers as well as enterprises. On a similar note, uh, it's also important to have an equitable slash uh, clear polar clauses in contracts rather than having an open-ended negotiation every year, right? Uh, and there are multiple ways through which polar is addressed. Our key point to note is that the verbiage and the approach of polar computation should be clear in contracts. And lastly, you know, and this was highlighted earlier too, we see an increased adoption of alternative commercial models. Um, alternative commercial models could be output-based, outcome-based uh, model. And the reason is because those provide increased flexibility. They also improve in incentives to reduce uh, delivery inefficiencies, which are there in some of the traditional models such as PNM or fixed price? Uh, let's see what's the last uh, um, remaining action item. Okay, so so this this last action item is for buyers to invest time in understanding uh, the more productive vendors within the portfolio itself before uh, before going to market and and, and running an RFX. Uh, by this, we mean that uh, there would be some objective assessment that they need to do. So how, how competitive is the pricing of an incumbent vendor? How it is performing um, in terms of you know, committed SLAs and efficiency? Whether or not the vendor has delivered on committed uh, innovation teams? So these are some of the areas which uh, the buyers should invest into. And, and these, are, these are tangible and objective assessment that uh, we have talked about before going to the um, RFX route. Uh, let's, let's hear from Vanushi as to which are some of the subjective assessments that uh, uh, the buyers should be cognizant of. Vanushi? Yeah. So uh, in terms of subjective assessments, right? And this is again, linking back to how buyer expectations have also changed over time. Because we're not just looking for, you know, price competitiveness value for money. We're also now looking for things such as 
how quickly are you able to adjust to changing demands how flexible are you how proactive are you in terms of dispute resolution what are the steps you take what is the governance you have right so i think there was a question in fact uh, within the chat on this innovation aspect right who is driving innovation is it the provider or is it the client and again i would always say that the answer to this question is joint innovation right the governance aspect of innovation is driven by enterprises so you are the ones you are supposed to provide platforms to the service providers to execute to give their ideas execute them have innovation days have the right clauses in your contracts so then it's obviously up to the supplier to be able to take that idea from ideation to execution and not just focus only on service delivery right but i think on that note uh, i would uh, you know this is the last slide in our particular webinar and we want to proceed to q and a now in the couple of minutes we have so uh, but that is the last point that we wanted to leave you with sure sure thanks manushi manushi uh, given that 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 you've covered the last page do you want to cover maybe um, and there was a question which we received uh, uh, you know uh, was there, which was around buyer expectations uh, in apac as compared to other geographies maybe a couple of points yeah. would be helpful on that. yeah sure sure so i think on that note right like uh, if we look at uh, north america and if you look at uk in particular the current macroeconomic landscape is very different right they're going through uh, you know recessionary trends and they are looking for service providers to be able to service their needs at this point of time right and when you come to this side of the globe you come to apac you see that we're already in a decent macroeconomic condition right we, there's a lot of cautionary uh, spending mindset that is there but in terms of it services and growth and all of those aspects you can see that it's at a decent level right so pro, uh, buyer expectations are more towards the subjective factors within apac whereas in na and uk while the dissatisfaction is there in those geographies as well but the whole uh, you know region also knows that at this point of time it's more about sort of getting the service providers to partner with them and tie them through these times right so the expectation is more from cost containment perspective uh, you know the price cuts and just delivering on time whereas over here on this side it's more about joint innovation flexibility responsiveness and so on and so forth okay thanks panushi uh prateek there was another interesting one on uh, legacy application skill sets you know have we been seeing a decline in availability uh, i know that's a question right up your sleeve so <laughs> go ahead uh, so so abhishek and uh, and it's important to highlight that there are two aspects to this question because the definition of legacy itself uh, is different for different stakeholders uh, legacy could include something like uh, standard java or dot net or c c++ because those are relatively legacy skills compared to the new age skills like uh, full stack development or cyber security or even generative ai now um, at least at least on these skills uh, we honestly are not seeing a decline in talent availability uh, but i think i think the respondent might be interested in the other aspects of legacy application uh, wherein you know something like cobol or mainframe comes into picture right uh, by nature for sure these are the areas wherein we are seeing decline in availability for um, such skills uh, we do not find experience we i mean it's it's difficult to find experience resources in such areas and uh, since the fresh talent is also not com coming so overall we see a uh, decline in the availability for these skills at least sure uh, i know that there are a few others i think we'll we'll attempt to answer them offline because we are at the top of the hour um so so yeah uh, in, in case there are any questions please uh, do feel free to reach out uh, at at the email ids uh, mentioned below and, uh, and yeah thanks thanks so much for joining in uh, and hope you have a have a great day and week ahead thank you